my name is Philip Martin, and I'm the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery here in Los Angeles uh, with my wife, Portia Hine, who you might have met um, at the fairs or in the gallery. Uh, we're certainly open by appointment at the gallery if you'd like to come and make a visit and uh, look forward to seeing you at, at one of the fairs, I suppose, when we figure out everything that's happening or back at the gallery. If you have any questions, of course, about any of the work that we're discussing today, just feel free to be in touch anytime. Um, and I'm really excited to be speaking here with Sky Glavish. We have his show, uh, The Caged Lark, uh, at the gallery through March 12th. Um, how are you doing today, Sky? I'm doing well, thanks, Philip. Yep. <laughs> so, um, this is a great show. It's the first show that you've done at the gallery. We did a little project earlier. Uh, it's titled The Caged Lark by a poem by uh, Gerald Manley Hopkins. You wanna talk a little bit about that? Um, well, actually a lot of my titles come from his poems, not just like I've used his poetry quite a bit. Um, when I first began university way back when, um, I got lucky the first, I went, to university as a mature student. So I, I dropped out of high school when I was 16. So when I went back to university, I was 20. Uh, and uh, they let you take, they let you come in as a mature student, but you have to take a class to sort of prove that you're, I don't know what, not crazy or something. So I, uh, I ended up taking a class from an English professor named Ron Markin, who I didn't know this, but he used to like to teach summer session just so that he might kind of have these different kind of encounters anyway ron markin turns out he was like an award-winning literature he's one of the leading lights of canadian literature so i just got super lucky that my very first class was this with this amazing professor called ron markin who loved jared gerard Mark, manley hopkins yeah. and so he really introduced me to, to poetry and to literature like he just made it so exciting so i went to university to become a literature major after taking that class i'm like i'm going to study english um, so anyway, yeah, that was my first class and, uh, it was my first encounter really with some of, um, with being in university, but also with sort of these more, uh, you know, issues around metaphor and allegory and symbolism and, um, you know, the language of poetry. That was my first as 20, 20 year old guy, never taking classes before. That was sort of my first encounter. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've always been a big fan of, um, of Hopkins poetry. But the cage is the poem is actually called the cage skylark. Uh -huh. So it's kind of like an, it has a little bit of a nod to my name too, uh, uh -huh. uh, and the idea of just being sort of like um, in your studio. And, and at one point in the poem, he's talking about the, the 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 lark would sing beautiful melodies, and you're kind of a, as an artist in your studio, you're kind of forcing yourself to sing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even if you don't want to sing, you know, in a way you, you, you've you got nothing to do but to sing. So there's a kind of a feeling of being locked in, in a way, um, anyway, like a feeling of isolation that, that can happen in the studio, even under normal circumstances. But that given this, the, cir the circumstances that we're in, that feeling was even enhanced to the point where it was almost like all I had was my studio mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a kind of a, a place to go. So the caged lark, the caged skylark, is all about this idea that um, we exist inside of inside these bodies, but really there's so much that's happening outside, like uh, outside of that little cage. Mm -hmm. And and how do how do we how do we encounter that? How do we make sense of it? How do we be a part of it when most of what we do is so internal and so circumscribed by our mind, on our bodies? So that's some. Uh, elements of that poem that I like. Well, in terms of a kind of encounter with interiority, um, perhaps you'd like to start by talking about this painting, and we have some detail shots which I can show as you discuss it a little bit. Um, yeah, that that is kind of an odd one to start with. Uh, <laughs> it's the darkest painting I've ever made. Um, in a, in metaphorically and also it, you know sort of literally i really love this painting um <laughs> i guess you're not supposed to say that about your own work but that this one when i had it in the studio was kind of really this ominous haunting kind of um thing it, it, it was inspired by uh, a, a, 
this is this is partly true and partly not true. Uh, it's partly true in the sense, or not true in the sense that I don't know the timeline. But wow. it, but at some point, this painting became about an experience I had. I have a buddy of mine who actually lived in LA for years. He's a musician, a really great musician. Played with the band War. His uh -huh. name is J.B. Echol, a fantastic guy, my best friend. But anyway, he um, he and I were were in Belize, and we were in this little town called Cozumel, and we were staying there for a few days, just he and I. We were like 16 or 17, uh -huh. and, uh, and we were walking along the ocean, uh -huh. and it was like just like that. It was black. The water was black, and the sky was black, and I dared J.B., to jump in the water and swim and, he, and he's like no there's no way in hell because it's actually shark there's sharks in that water too but anyway i'm like okay fine and i was at that stage of my life where i would do crazy stuff like that so i just took off my clothes and started swimming out and he he jumped in behind me and we swam we just tested our, ourselves to see how far we could swim into the black ocean in night before we would scare ourselves too much and turn around um but yeah so that it was kind of triggered by a memory I've had of swimming out into just sheer blackness. And, um, and but also, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say as a painting, it also kind of reminds me of of Rothko in a lot of ways. Is that what do you think of that idea? Yeah. So the so the original idea came from um, thinking about how I could approach those paintings by Rothko, especially the late ones, like mm -hmm. uh, the really the really the ones he did just at the end of his life. Yeah. So if you were in my studio, you would see all these books on Rothko. Um, and, and I'm like, I'm to say I'm a huge fan is, 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 uh, it's not the right words. I, I adore those paintings. Yeah. Like that, that whole school of painters from Barnett Newman and Frankenthaler was a little bit later, but Barnett Newman and Clifford Still, you know, some people criticize Rothko for becoming too literary or too symbolic or, or too, you know, works that were all about sort of life and death and um, angst or whatever but when i've i've been in front of i've been in galleries where i'll come across come around the corner and and, and see a rothko and my knees just kind of buckle yeah um i just i i love that work i love everything about it um however it's such difficult work to approach because he reduced his painterly language to sort of these really essential elements mm -hmm. and so it's like how do you get near uh how do you get near something like that? Right. So with the with that painting, it was kind of like a it was kind of a way in in a way. The thing yeah. about the ocean, yeah. Well, I think you know Rothko. You know when people talk, there's a great show. There's a great catalog about the spiritual and art. And I can't. It's the one I'm thinking of. I'm, I'm sure there's been a million shows, but I have one that's from the probably mid 2000s. But I mean, you think about the sublime and expressions of the sublime and people experiencing the sublime there's any number of famous people like Caspar David Friedrich and then someone like Rothko of course is also expressing human experience too and a, a kind of sublime and there's a kind of continuum between them though um, though they they are very different paintings perhaps in appearance or perhaps in the way that one might want to categorize them the basic experience of seeing a very large painting like that and feeling that kind of emotion or questions of where you locate yourself in terms of place as a viewer, they're very powerful questions. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think you've, you've hit on it. That's part of the problem with Rothko is that, you know, there's issues of the sublime and the transcendent and even the spiritual are, are have become, you know, in a lot of ways, for me, they've become tropes in a way. Um, you know, or they become like it's easy to lose the the, the meaning um, because it something <clears throat> something like the sublime. It's like you you it, you can't sort of seek that out almost in a painting. Mm -hmm. Like it's not really a it's not really a goal in a way of a painting because it's too it's too fleeting and f you know f uh, it's it's not something that you can. I don't know. It's I don't seek. I didn't start out thinking about the sublime. But I what did start out thinking about Rothko, um, mm -hmm. and then thinking about how to make that my own. Actually, like to take that on board. I'll talk a little bit more about that later with the sun piece because yeah. that's really that was really like, you know, thinking about a certain motif in art or thinking about mm -hmm. a certain structure, 
and 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 avoiding it because the it's it's terrain that's been so well kind yeah. of trodden over. Uh, and as a younger artist, you would you would you'd have to avoid that in a way yeah. because you just it's going to swallow you. Sure. Um, well, this painting, um, Magic Mountain, you painted before the Black Sea painting. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you mentioned to me in one of our conversations that actually aspects of the building of this painting led to the building of the Black Sea painting in terms of these little sort of diamond sections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this, this was a real breakthrough for me, this painting. For Talk sure. It's about kind of how you put this painting together and, and yeah, this was this was really a, a kind of a high moment for me when I was working on this show because I realized that the space of mountains is often thought of almost like skyscrapers, like an outline, you know, mm -hmm. like a like peaks and or whatnot. Like we tend to think of mountains in terms of this this jagged edge in the in the distance. But I started to think about it internally, like what is it, what's the inside of the mountain? Like the like the chest or the torso of the mountain in a way, or the the body of it, um, which gave me a, an insight into thinking about landscape that wasn't perspectival. It was mm -hmm. totally flat, which was really great because one of the issues I have with the, the landscape for me is I don't always want to be in that unifocal sort of that single vanishing perspectival thing. Mm -hmm. um, so with the mountain painting. Um, I was able to sort of flatten everything up onto the surface and then and to think about the geometry so you'll see things like arrows and like like literally like arrows pointing down or arrows pointing up or like wow. or little little sort of moments to say it's all happening inside of inside of this kind of um you know this kind of structure um and it's it, in a sense it's about geometry but in another sense it's about trying to create space yeah. trying to create movement and light and motion but keeping everything completely flat on the surface and and of course that's the quintessential sort of modernist problem you know with going back to cubism but um it's a problem that i've always loved because mm -hmm. i like the flatness of painting just like i like the flatness of textiles mm -hmm. like the extreme flatness of a piece of cloth you know i like that because it feels like a, it, it feels like the parameters um you know, it's nice to have those parameters to work with. But yeah, like if you get up to the painting, another thing about this painting for me was kind of like an index of of things that I'm interested in in painting. Yeah. Like like ways of making it a painting, ways of thinking about space, ways of creating yeah. difference and like, you know, A using geometry, B using color, C using mark making, all these all these elements to sort of bring them together. And then back to the question about the Black Sea. Yeah, I started to realize that if if I had these little triangulated, almost like argyle patterns or diamond shapes, if I flipped it on its side, I could imagine that being like water. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm also thinking about fire. Like I'm thinking, well, you could do the same thing with elements like fire. So that's an idea that I'm working on right now. But um, but yeah, so that painting was really useful for 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 kind of um, approaching these issues like water or or like um, like a tree or or anything anything that's kind of in our in our frame of reference, but sort of breaking it into a geometry, but not doing that in a way just to break it into geometry, like not just to stylize it, but to actually kind of create it so that it has its own language apart right. from nature. And two questions then relating to that. I mean, I think one thing, of course, is obviously seeing the paintings in person is completely different than seeing them here. And one thing about this painting that I would just point out to people is all, as you can see, the, all these the red marks are not something that I had seen or apprehended so much from, from some of my initial images I saw of it. But in person, you really feel this play bet between those the red marks and the darker marks. Also, Maybe this is a moment to talk about just a little bit in terms of the variation in the surfaces that you have with using sand, because here you can kind of see it a little bit in the background. Do you want to just briefly explain your process to people materially? Uh, well, the first thing is that structure that's in the sky, like the there's a kind of a line that that goes up. I, I cover the, the paintings before I start working on them with mm -hmm. sand. Right. Um, and so there's a kind of like a like a and I can get rid of it. Like I got rid of it in the ocean. <laughs> I, 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 I totally wiped that out away. But within the mountain painting, there's a kind of like a like a some linear thing that 
goes up from almost like a wall, like, like the painting yeah. is painted on a brick wall or something. But anyway, so that's an important part is that I start working on the sand, the surface. And the reason that I'm doing that in part is because I like to stain the paintings with very, very thin layers of like turpentine and, and, um, and oil paint. Yeah. And I roll, I roll it on with a roller. And, and, and sand actually creates this incredible bond. Mm -hmm. uh, like it allows me to stain without the thing. So anyway, I like the surface, but then also when I painting on it, like if you go back to the mountain painting for a sec, you'll see, um, I don't know if you can see it in the details that you've pointed out, but um, there are some areas that are really almost like electric blue. Yeah. And the reason that they're like that is um, I've covered that, like okay there's a triangle sort of there's like a line of black triangles that goes right up but immediately to the right yeah right there to the right of yeah follow that line up mm -hmm. and then to the right of it right there to the right of that that set of triangles is a patch of blue mm -hmm. well in real life that's almost like glowing yeah because it's a thick built up area of sand that i've stained with blue paint Right. So the so the blue paint caught in that in that sandy area and didn't catch in other areas. So sometimes I'll like uh, there'll be little patches that I that I fill with sand and then allow the staining to catch those areas and not catch other areas. But it's really just a technique for when I'm painting. I used to do this thing where if I didn't like the painting, I'd scrape it all off. Right. Like with turpentine. And then I'd start again and build it up again. Now, instead of scraping it off, I'll pour sand over the whole surface and rebuild it. Right. And the, and whatever is sort of humming underneath it, I just sort of bring back to the surface. So rather than taking it down to zero, I just keep adding to it and right. they get pretty thick. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because um, as we were sort of, you know, talking about, I think that such a big part of painting is scale. And of course, the mm -hmm. scale of these paintings really puts you in a very specific relationship to them. And then, of course, also the sense of materiality. I think that you have this what you know I meant with sand but it, it it feels like very much a very painterly materiality I mean it, it paint paint is of course pigment in a vehicle and that pigment is dirt and that vehicle could mm -hmm. be oil or turpentine or something water-based but mm -hmm. um but that kind of materiality has a real kind of logic to it it completely makes sense and they they um and that sense that that materiality is very strong and you kind of feel it bodily as it um reflects upon you also in many ways this yeah, well, that is well. The paint is actually just minerals, right? Like, yeah. like you could take it like a mineral, like cobalt. It's just a stone. Yeah, like a like a mineral, and you ground up. So these are, you know, sand is just a is just like granite or something ground up too. So it's actually a very akin to paint. Um, and I don't want it to be a gimmick. Like I actually don't include. Like so I noticed that you put oil and sand when you just list the, the ingredients, which is fine. But when I look at the old paintings of Picasso and Brock, they just put oil on canvas, even though when you go and see them at the Met or whatever, they're full of sand. Uh, <laughs> they don't even include, they don't even include they? that. I don't even think I knew that. Yeah, but anyway, no, I like, I don't want it to be kind of like Well, it doesn't gimmick. come across as a gimmick. It doesn't come across as a gimmick at all. I think what's really exciting is that it, it, um, it just, it, it just, has this very specific feeling. I don't really know how to describe it. It feels very solid and but you just feel connected to it bodily. And I think the paint has its own feel. It has a feeling in terms of how it goes on there. Um, yeah, it's extremely, it, it just feels very coherent. Well, there's also the way light hits it too is kind of weird. Yeah. Like and it's actually that. refracting light yeah. in, in weird ways. And sometimes you can get up to it and it's kind of glittering like yeah. glittering like you cover the, the surface with little flakes of glitter mm -hmm. especially that moon like the moon in this one is totally it's actually the white of that the moon is, mm -hmm. is sand yeah that's not paint it's just white sand yeah. so the moon in real life in the paint not like when you get right up to it you'll see it's just sparkling like like yeah. little teeny jewels or something yeah. so i like that i like that play with with the the surface that it allows but i'm actually trying to do some paintings right now without any sand because i don't want it to be a, i don't want to fall into this sort of pattern but <laughs> well i think this so this painting is of course called the is called the cage lark uh any thoughts on how you titled this one uh, i actually had a cage uh in the top left in the top right hand corner i was uh -huh. going to make that a cage uh -huh. there well you can kind of see those and I left enough of it to sort of suggest a cage, but also yeah. it could be like branches. I thought it was too literal to literally be a, a bird cage. Um, yeah. 
but yeah, it was, it was the title that I was playing around with for the show. And I, and I, I, this is the third time I've come at this motif. I did a small yeah. painting for that I sent, uh, uh, I can't remember where it went now, but it was a small painting. And then I did another one that I really loved. Well, there's a portrait. I sold, I sold it to my, my I sold it to my nephew. <laughs> so it never saw the light of day. It went from me to my nephew. And then I thought, should I ask my nephew for this painting back? And he would have given it to me back, like to show. Yeah. And I thought, you know, and, and his, his partner, Monica, uh, who I just adore, um, she loved this painting. So he bought it for her as a gift. Yeah. Um, and I was like, no, it's, it's got a new home. So I decided to take another stab at that yeah. same motif. Yeah. But in this, but in this one, I was also kind of like, in a sense, it was like the, a culmination of a lot of the concerns that I've been working on for a year or two. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it is pointing to the garden. It is pointing to the nighttime. It is pointing mm -hmm. to the moon, all those things. And I was trying to sort of condense all of those things, like weave them into a, into a painting. Uh, so it's quite an ambitious painting in terms yeah. of all the stuff that I was going, that I was working on. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And that's why I wanted it to be, reflected in the title of the show yeah and this motif of course in terms of using motifs is reflected here in the painting that i have in my house exactly yeah 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 and that's one of the first ones uh, that i did with that nighttime garden i think i think that mm -hmm. one's called night garden and i think that's the you own the first one that i did in that kind of vein so that's interesting <laughs> <laughs> you know also, this is a nice one that's hard to express in person in terms that's when you see in person in terms of the opacity of the black and the more the feeling of transparency that is in the lighter areas. I kept painting that over and over, uh, Philip. Yeah. I painted that black probably five times because <laughs> I wanted I wanted it to be totally black. Yeah. And it could and there was always something sort of shining through or shimmery and I wanted it flat, matte black. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it took a lot to get it that that quality. I, I use Williamsburg paint, which is a really great paint. Uh, it was a handmade paint from Brooklyn, from New York. Yeah. I think they're bought out by another company, now, but whatever they have. The Mars Black is just so it's it's almost got red in it. Oh. It's just but it's so like deep. So I actually when I ran out of it, I kind of panicked and I went hunting for it and I got a bunch. I bought a bunch more because yeah. I just love that incredible dark. Some of their that, pigments. It's a really so black. Anyway, some sorry. of those pigments, those Williamsburg pigments, just to completely jump in for no reason whatsoever. I remember <laughs> some of them so clearly in terms of how they changed my own painting practice when I oh, got some oh. of them, like the turkey umber, the corbet green, their corbet green, yeah. corbet green, and also yeah. their provenance violet light. I think some of the those are colors where, like, when I put them in the paint, I just had never seen that col those colors in my painting before, and they were really nice. Hey, moving on. Yeah. Um, so, tell us about Lake in the Forest because this is, of course, the first of all the paintings in this yep. group. That's the first one. Well, I had done a show uh, a couple years ago with Clint Rowanish Gallery in Toronto. Mm -hmm. This it's the, the gallery that represents my work yeah. in in Toronto, and, and then of course it's um, me to the work. So he's a great gallery in Toronto. Exactly. Yeah. He, if it wasn't for Clint, I don't think you and I would have met. So props to <laughs> to uh, him for 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 that. Yeah. Um, and he's a great guy. To, he's just a great gallery and a great yeah. ga guy to work with, and a, yeah. and a super sweet, uh, generous guy. But yeah. anyway. Enough blowing smoke over at Clint. Um, <laughs> Blow smoke for Clint. I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I had done a show with him called The Valley of Love. And in that show, I was kind of avoiding the landscape. There was, a, there was kind of like a building. Yeah. There was a, uh, a, a wedding scene that was coming out of Gothic painting. Yeah. There was a garden, you know, a sort of a sunflowery kind of thing. And then at the very end, I did a landscape. Yeah. And it was kind of like, okay, now I'm doing landscapes. Like I was trying to like keep it at bay. But then when that show came down, that was actually the painting. It's called uh, it's called the clearing. The National Gallery purchased it. But that was the painting that kind of still had my, um, you know, there was something about that painting that I didn't feel like was I wasn't finished with it. So with this painting, uh, I wanted to kind of pick up on what I had been doing with that work and to treat the landscape um, in a way that would allow me allow uh, allow me a way into it like mm -hmm. allow me back into that kind of a thing. And so it wasn't so much about, again, about space or about trying to de depict, you know, the landscape that I see. It was more about the kind of the landscape of painting, mm -hmm. um, the space of painting, you know, the, the space of, of my imagination and 
and my own visual language, like really trying to figure out what my visual language is. And so one of the things I do in this painting is wherever there's, wherever there's a fractal or like a branch, it mm -hmm. ends on another branch. Uh -huh. Like everything, everything ends on, like nothing is just jutting out into space. Like every branch kind of feeds into another branch and every, every facet kind of bends into another facet. And, and the reason I point that out is because it's an extremely contrived painting. Yeah. It wasn't, there's nothing about this painting that was kind of like, um, it wasn't just painting something to make it look like something. I was yeah. exploring my own visual sort of vocabulary. Yeah. Uh, and then, and it was, it was a fun painting to make because once I had done that one, uh -huh. um, I knew that I could build on that to, to build a show. Yeah. Well, that's really an interesting painting because there are some moments in it, like over in here, or there are different places in this painting where you can see that the motif has kind of taken its own life and you're having a conversation with your motif, if that yeah. makes sense, in the course of painting the painting. And um, you've talked yeah. about finding the painting in the painting, uh, so to speak, before. Um, and this mm -hmm. is a painting that does that. Does that. Yeah, it was, it was really about, for me, it's like a love letter in a way to, to painting and to thinking about uh, making, making my own, um, walking into that, that forest on my own, you know, like yeah. trying to be a part of that conversation and not hiding from it, like not, you know, not worrying about being a landscape painter, just, just having fun with, with what my language was evolving into, letting go actually, and, and just letting things kind of, you know, be what they, be what they, they would become. Well, I and think it was fun. Really and I, yeah. Time for expression in painting. I mean, you said this earlier that, you know, at least, you know, when I was in the, in school in the late nineties, I mean, there were a lot of things that people questioned whether you could do them or, or mm -hmm. should do them, all kinds of things with regard to, to expression. And I think it's a really interesting time to, to see how, you know, where we are and to. Yeah, me too allow that out um i think it's an amazing time right now to be honest i mean i know there's there's incredible challenges and and i'm not trying to like i don't think painting i don't think we should shy away from some of the incredible obstacles that that we face you know in in well in canada but you know in north america in general but at the same time i think the language of painting for me is a healing kind of um I mean, it's something that I need. It's almost like food or oxygen. Yeah. Like I need to be able to like, you know, to explore these ideas and, 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 and to feel that connection to the creative process. Like it's just, it, it, like I realize how, how important it is for me, but mm -hmm. I also think it's important for, for everybody like, like to feel that sense of, yeah. um, they, they can get lost in, 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 thinking about the relationship to their bodies, thinking about the relationship to their imagination, to culture, to, to the landscape. Um, and I, and I think it's valuable. It's a valuable thing. And, and I, there, maybe there's an element of escapism that that's a criticism level that painting, but I also feel like, um, there's a, there's an element of communion too. Yeah. Like I, you were bringing I think up. That that's a great word to use just in terms of a sense of humanity, shared humanity, and understanding ourselves and one another. I think that's one of the things with you know, COVID is shocking and as it's been, I wouldn't have necessarily thought I would come away from COVID really believing in art more, but you know, the power of human experience is, it is, is well, it's the power of human experience. And I think COVID, that painting does allow people to express who we are and the things that bring us together. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the moon dwindled and thinned? That's a great title. Well, that's another. That's an, that's a title from another. Uh, uh, I believe that's from another Gerald Manley Hopkins poem. Yeah, that's a great. One. Um, and I also use titles from Paul Celan too. Uh, I'm a thief when it comes to poetry <laughs> and titles. But yeah, this was. Um, you know, this one was. It's originally started off as an ocean painting, so it was just the moon and the ocean. Yeah like the other one, but I didn't, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe that I found a way into the geometry of the water and the re relationship to the moon. Yeah. Uh, it was a big moon and, and uh, over top of water. And it just, it felt like, um, I, I don't know what it felt like. It just didn't feel like a painting. So yeah. then I added the trees. Um, and then when I added the trees, it was like, now some people have referred to this and they said, one guy actually wrote to me and said, oh, you're copying Matthew Wong. 
which was really interesting because a I was born I mean I was painting around the time that Matthew Wong was born sure uh and he's uh, he's from Edmonton and I was actually you know I went to school in Edmonton I, I really love Matthew Wong and I was really really sad to, to what you know how how his life was cut short yeah but I had really no um I've been working with the landscape and this motif since about 1996 yeah and I, you know, I've got paintings from 1996. So, but anyway, the reason I'm bringing that up is just to say this is a conversation that goes on uh, with artists and with other artists, you know. And sometimes, like when I put this beside Matthew Wong, and if you put the two paintings together, I would say, oh yeah, it's incredible the kind of dialogue or the, sure. you know, the the relationship to those two. But when you look at the overall body of work, you realize we're doing very 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 different things yeah. so this painting was inspired by the painting by monk called the freeze of life yeah. and it's it that's where i got the, that idea for those trees that's where i got the idea of the that that sort of those branches on the right kind of swinging yeah. down and a lot of my work is is directed at at edvard monk yeah. uh, and and almost almost directed at him like a like he's a bully yeah. Like, like you've been, you've been beating me up and pushing me around and, and screaming at me for 20 years. I'm fighting back. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I sometimes go at Edward Monk, like, like I'm, like I'm antagonistic towards him. Well, although I, I love him. So I love the, the, I love the connection to Matthew Wong. I think I'm glad that that caught out, but I, but it was literally one that kind of came out of obliquely and then when i noticed it i was like oh my heart we, our hearts were in the same place yeah. me and matthew were falling in love with the same person yeah well i think that you know painting again is a conversation and it's a conversation yeah. with different things i mean i see to me i can't help but see the tonality of african textiles in your work i mean there's a lot of different kinds of things that well my mom used to make batik yeah like that's she, what she's that's an artist I'm seeing yeah. a lot of other kinds of things. I mean, I think that's the beauty. We bring to paintings what we bring to them. And yeah, I think sorting out this whole question of expression is recognizing that we are part of a greater conversation and culture or with, with the past and with the present yeah. and, and the yeah. ability to overlap and talk and connect with other people. It's all exciting, you know? I mean, yeah, exactly. You know, um, this painting too, I, I <laughs> I love I love Monk. Monk, it's really funny that you say that because, well, first of all, who doesn't love Monk? But then, you know, you discover these things about the guy, like it's the winter studio. That's the one yeah. that really gets me, that he's out there in the snow. Yeah. <laughs> painting. <laughs> Just feel you know, like such a loser, you know? I mean, my God, like the commitment to vision that he is, is yeah, it's articulating there is just such a powerful yeah. thing for people to think about. I think it's just so beautiful. It this is painting it just is, unbelievable. Yeah. There's so much, the light moments in this are just incredible and uh, such a pleasure to, to be in front of here. So we're obviously going over just a little bit, but you know, I think it's okay. Yeah, we got to finish with the last painting. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do the so last painting. I, I can make my conclusion. <laughs> okay. Um, so again, um, uh, yeah, it's just such a pleasure to talk to you and such a pleasure for everyone to join us today. So thank you so much. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's talk here about the. So, uh, so speaking about Monk, this was literally from Monk, <laughs> and he, he he has the great painting called the Sun, yeah. and I wanted to do a painting of the Sun, but I couldn't do it because of him. Sure. And I was like, you know, there's no way I can I can, I can't seem to weasel my way around this. <laughs> like I couldn't find my own way into it, and I tried. I did a lot of little little studies. So in the end, what I did is I actually painted the painting, the sun. I could show you an image of it. I made a copy of it. Sure. Uh, and then from that copy of the sun, uh, which was in my studio when I was working on, and there was a there's an artist in New York um, who I was talking with. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do this, like <laughs> copy this painting directly and try to do something with me. He's like, there's no other way to do it. You just yeah. got to go straight out. So anyway, I did. And then what happened was, um, you know, the, the the presence of that motif it was so strong that it was almost like you know I wouldn't say it was like a joke but it was like a farce like it was like a bad a really really bad copy so then I just kept working on it um you know like daily for for quite a few weeks yeah and then uh and then I'm like you know what 
I need to add some trees. <laughs> and it was actually in breaking up that surface into verticals. Yeah. Uh, and then you allowing the trees to be kind of like text. Yeah. And the really fascinating thing about this, Philip, I haven't told you this yet, but a, 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 an artist that I follow on Instagram, uh -huh. who is a Persian calligrapher, all his, I, all totally. his, he wrote to me and he said, are you putting in Arabic text? Yes, we have not and discussed I said, it, but there's a lot of other stuff I'm seeing in here. And this, keeps yeah, and I said, I said, no, I'm not. And then he showed yes. me that I was actually using an Arabic text in that the top so right cool. corner. That is so cool. So, so that whole top part becomes a little bit like a language yes. or a little bit like, like calligraphy, like writing. Yes. And, and that, and that allowed me to break up the, the monk thing in a way, like to, to break it, to break through it. And then in the end, um, what I ended up doing is I, I normally don't like to work quite this, this way, but, but, yeah. but, a, but imposing that, that very precise kind of structure of the, of the burst, the rays of the sun allowed me to make the surface kind of like, um, I don't know, allow me to actually bring, like, what happens is you get those sort of rings, but that's all the paint coming up from behind. Yeah. The things I've left alone. So I, anyway, this I was the that painting person, that I... That that person wrote you, because I have totally seen letter forms in the top, and, and it's kind of like, I'm very obsessed with the upper band of the trees, because, you know, you have this very readable aspect, you have the, the sense of your presence there, the sense of the sun, it's like a very understandable and powerful relationship but then there's all this like kind of hallucinatory shifting stuff that's happening in the upper band of the painting. That's really, um, it's just so amazing that that guy wrote you. I think that's incredible. Yeah. Well, and the upper part of the painting came from complete desperation. <laughs> like that was me, like literally just with a pot of paint, just like, <laughs> no, you know, attacking it because I was just so lost in trying to deal with this problem of this painting. But yeah. then it, the, as soon as I did that, though, and you can see all the drips coming to off of it. The, as soon as I did that, it's like, oh, I finally found my way. And it was at that moment where I, I had totally given up on it. I love the idea that the, that from what you're telling us that the painting is starting with the like, can't, can I even do this? Like bad idea, desperation. Yeah, it's bad all idea. Fine. It's exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a beautiful, yeah. beautiful painting, and it's been a great uh, show. So the so the so the the title of it is is Sun Gate. Yeah. Originally, it was just going to be called the Gate, but I thought the Gate, but that Persian text in the top corner yeah. means the Gate. You're kidding. Uh, no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh my god. The guy wrote to me and he said that actually spells gate. It actually says that's so incredible. Anyway, that was, that's incredible. Well, again, well, he, he showed whole, me that the, the, the text will do that. Yeah. Well, again, it goes back to this whole thing. And I think it's a, what goes back to this conversation about painting is I feel that the painting canon is changing so much right now. And, you know, we are um, seeing people um, that, that have not, you know, when I say we, I mean, the sort of art market generally, obviously I'm a white male. There's a lot of stuff I just have, you know. You are? No, <laughs> there's a lot that I have just yeah. not known. And I think it's an incredible time for painting because it's this incredibly powerful vehicle and there are so many voices and we're seeing so much interesting stuff. And then to make a piece that just overtly connects to another tradition, even if you didn't, you know, intend it, and then to have those kinds of relationships and that ability to talk to someone who's in a totally different, one would think, um, professional arena, calligraphy, um, or some sort of analysis of Persian miniatures. And it's just incredible. I think that's amazing. So that's kind of a great yeah, that was, note it, to it was nice, yeah. end on. Is there anything that you might want to say to people before we go? Well, you know, no, I, I just want to say thank you. Uh, uh, this has been a really great um, relationship for me to to sort of stumble into in a way. Um, it's not it's not every day that us Canadian artists find a, uh, a an audience outside of you know Canada. Um, I have some friends in the states, but oftentimes you like they move to Los Angeles or New York and then they build up a network. But it's it's kind of in a sense it's kind of really interesting for me to be parachuted in and yeah. still like I didn't get to go to the show I'm still yeah, well, in London Ontario sure so anyway it's it's just been really kind of a surreal almost to have this 
uh, conversation with artists, especially and people in yeah. Los Angeles. Yeah. Well, um, I used to live in Los Angeles. I used to live in Venice Beach. I was on sixth and rows when I lived in, nice. in, in LA. But anyway, um, the point that I'm making is just, it's been a really wonderful opportunity. I'm really grateful. Um, and I just think that, you know, there's, there's a generosity kind of, of response right now that might, like you said, have something to do with us feeling kind of so isolated, but I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the, um, the connection and yeah. the, uh, I'm feeling a kind of a camaraderie with people that I don't even know. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting place. And so anyway, I, I just want to say thanks for the well, opportunity. It's a total pleasure. And I mean, I would, you know, again, it's like we could start new conversations here. I don't think you and I have trouble uh, talking, but I mean, I think again, but just seeing like, I think how people are communicating via Instagram and these kinds of very broad conversations, it's a much, um, it's really exciting, I think, in terms of a lot of the things that are happening in the art world right now. And when we get back to being able to travel more and see each other more, I think it's gonna be really interesting to hear about how different people's experiences have been during COVID and, and everything that we've learned. I know it's been a nice time of <clears throat> reset for me. And the show has been great, you know? So it's been, one, it's been amazing. I think the thing about Canadians that I would only add is just that Americans often don't realize that people are Canadians. And I only mean, because right. how many, I mean, we just all we have to talk about is Neil Young. <laughs> it's yeah. it's Joni Mitchell. The, yeah, the greatest rock musicians of all time. So anyway, it's funny for you to say that, yeah. but um, yeah, you just be just another misunderstood. <laughs> <laughs> another misunderstood Canadian. There you go. <laughs> well, anyway, it's been a, such a pleasure to have the conversation with you. Thank you so much for joining us and love the show. And thank you to everybody that came to see the talk and has participated. And once again, you know, our hearts really do go out for everybody in this time with COVID. And it's been really, really great to have my artist as a kind of art world for me. And I've really enjoyed sharing it with you. So thanks so much, Sky. Thank you.